Hello everyone, I'm Connor Henderson. I'm joined today with Bryson Hilton. He's a PhD student at the University of Oregon and we're going to be discussing choice model analysis using logistic regression to model customer behavior and use that to estimate a customer's lifetime value and see how sensitivity between characteristics of customers can impact their expected lifetime value and then how that's a good decision tool for managers who are trying to uh, allocate their resources, see if their tactics are paying off. So we have a case that we're going to discuss. It's related to an assignment for my class and some other classes. So if you are in a class that uses the marketing strategy based on first principles and data analysis textbook by Rob Palmatier and Hari Sridhar, um, this might be related to an assignment you have. So this is their book and this is technically considered their second data analytics case, although I expect an update as they come out with the second edition of their book. So the case we wrote um, was about acquiring new customers in the hospitality industry. In particular, we imagine that a student graduates and is becoming like a region market manager for Airbnb. And in this particular case, we imagine that Eugene, Oregon, where the University of Oregon is located, is going to be opening up to Airbnb again after a time when the city had shut down access uh, from the Airbnb platform to Eugene, Oregon. And so the, one of my students, we're imagining, has been hired to kickstart that marketplace by trying to get new travelers to come and, and book and also to get hosts, people who live in Eugene, to have their properties available for short-term rental on Airbnb. Okay, so just the case has some background about Airbnb and uh, how it kind of works, um, which most people should be familiar with uh, nowadays. But we want to use some data to um, predict who's most likely to be acquired as a new traveler, so customer acquisition, and then who's likely to remain as a host um, over time, so host retention. So we have two data sets. The first data set is traveler data. And we imagine that in order to get um, travelers to book on Airbnb, let's say the student manager has a friend who maybe works for Alaska Airlines, and they're willing to do the emails that get sent to people who book a flight from Seattle to Eugene, they're willing to let Airbnb promote itself in those emails for the cost of $3 per email sent. So these are potentially good qualified leads, right? People who are traveling from Seattle to Eugene on an Alaska Airlines flight would potentially be someone who would stay um, in some lodging, potentially an Airbnb. And so we agreed to send um, 3,000 emails as a pilot study, and that's going to cost $9,000 total. And instead of just sending one blanket email, we decided to break it up into three different offers. So randomly assign people receiving the emails to get one of three offers or one of three campaigns. And each of those would have certain characteristics. And we want to see which one of those three campaigns would be most effective. And also how other characteristics of the traveler that we can observe would predict their likelihood to respond positively to the email campaign. Overall, we want to assess if it's worthwhile to continue to give Alaska Airlines money in order to promote Airbnb in the confirmation emails that get sent out to travelers as they purchase their flight or get close to traveling on their flight. So um, the three different kind of campaigns that have been created or email promotion types. The first one just says, hey, you're traveling to Eugene. If you book a stay with Airbnb, you get $25 off. So it's going to cost us $25 in lost revenue. It's not going to come out of the pocket of the host who is going to be letting them rent a room in Airbnb. Um, the second offer would be that we would provide free transportation. So we'd work with the loki local taxi service and say, we will cover your trip from the airport to your Airbnb if you book with us. And so that's also the same cost to us, it's going to cost us $25 that we prearrange with the local taxi company. And then the third email would be basically something that would be cost free for us, at least no additional cost other than the cost that goes to Alaska Airlines 
in terms of the three dollars to send the email but it would just be uh promoting the opportunity to stay on airbnb and having a welcome email that might highlight eugene so maybe we created a branded video a youtube video and it has some features around eugene kind of like a local travel and also promotes the great um, options to stay one in an Airbnb in Eugene. So we convert these in our data set into dummy variables that is a one or a zero for the $25 off and for the free taxi. You don't need to have a variable in your data set for the welcome email because if you get a zero for the first option, $25 off, and you get a zero for the second option, the free taxi, then by kind of process of elimination, you must be getting the third email. So we're going to look at the comparison of the effectiveness of each of the $25, um, the costly promotions versus the one that would be free. At least there's no additional cost if someone books on Airbnb if they just saw that um, video that we provided. So that would be our default reference category when we go ahead and do the modeling. Other information we have about travelers is we know the email that they use to book their flight on Alaska Airlines. Now Alaska Airlines won't give us the specific email, but they will provide us the at whatever the back end of the email is. So we know if they're a Gmail user, a Yahoo user, a .edu, or other. So we have a reference category. Again, if you're not one of those first three, you must be in that fourth category of some other type of email account. We know the status of the traveler in terms of their Alaska Airlines um, frequent flyer program. So are they a member of the frequent flyer program? Um, that would be scored as a two. Um, are they an MVP? So it's a higher status level, right? Then they're scored as a three. And if they're not currently a member of the frequent flyer program, they'd be scored as a one. We know not their exact address, but some information about the address that they put down when they booked their flight. So we are told if they're from out of state, so they're not from Oregon. If they're from Oregon, but their location is not in Eugene Springfield area. And then lastly, if they are in the Spring Eugene Springfield area, and those have been converted into dummy variables that are a one if they're in the location or a zero otherwise, with out of state being the reference category. So they get a one if they're from Oregon, but not Eugene. They get a zero if somewhere else. They get a one if they're from Eugene or Springfield, a zero if somewhere else. And then if they got a zero in both of those, then they must be from out of state. So it's really important to understand the nature of your variables. Is there some kind of ordinal rank to them where bigger is better, bigger is more? Or if it's more categorical, where you just belong to a category. In that case, you take the total number of categories that you're interested in. You pick one of those categories to be a reference category. And that would be determined if you got a zero in all the other variables. So any predictive model needs to be set up. The data needs to be set up correctly in order for it to run. Um, next we have age, so how old they are um, from when they booked the flight on Alaska. We know the outcome. This is our key variable we want to predict, which is whether or not they ended up booking a stay on Airbnb after receiving the email. So one is yes, zero is no. That's going to be our dependent variable or our outcome variable that we're going to use all these other variables to predict. And the other things we know about them is the number of tickets that were booked on the itinerary. So are, is there just one person traveling alone or maybe there's two or three or four people all traveling on the same itinerary? And the type of ticket, is it round trip um, or is it one way to Eugene? Okay. So with all this information, it goes into a data set. Um, in this case, the original data is shown here. This list is the calibration data. So we have, oh, this is the host data actually. Um, so here it is for the travelers. We know the choice that they made, whether to book on Airbnb or not. So it's a one if they did, it's a zero if not. Up here, there's a frequency table of uh, observed choices. And so we see that um, about 85% of people did not book on Airbnb, but about 15% did. So there is kind of a bias or a tendency of travelers not to book, but 15% response rate for the email campaign would be you know, excellent um, for most email campaigns. And 
So right here, this is our, our outcome, and that's what we're trying to um, predict. And then we have um, basically what type of uh, email promotion they got is captured in these first two columns. Right now it's ranked, it's ordered by which one they got. So all these people got the offer to have $25, $25 off their stay. If they didn't have that one, but they did have the email taxi, that meant they got the $25 free voucher for a trip from the airport to their their location um, this is the type of email account they had it would be gmail yahoo or edu um, the frequent flyer status where their address is from age number of tickets and if it was round trip or not okay so what i did is i used the ingenious marketing analytics software um, to estimate the relationship between these predictors and the outcome that we care about, whether or not they book to stay. The predictive model uses logistic regression, so I just uploaded the data here. But this uh, software program is really effective for marketing related um, kind of tools, so marketing analytics. But you can access the same exact techniques for free using R, so it's very easy just to Google logistic regression in R, which is the kind of modeling behind a choice model, a customer choice model. And it's not a linear regression, it's a logistic regression. So I just, you know, Googled it and this was one of the first results that comes up. So like the probability of being some outcome given some predictors is basically what it does. And you can see there's code down here that you could kind of easily learn just in one weekend if you download the free software R and went ahead and um, did some modeling there. But if you're willing to pay a little bit, you can use this kind of structured format that's already built for you. So you upload the data, assuming it's all oriented correctly. You have the customer ID in rows. You have the variables in columns. And the main column you care about is, did they or did they not book a stay on Airbnb? So if I hit predictive model, I'm doing a predictive model where I'm trying to see the likelihood that someone chooses between two alternatives so they do or do not do something. In marketing, that's usually the kind of main first thing we care about. Did they respond to our promotion or not? Did they buy or did they not buy? Did they stick around or did they leave us? Um, there's lots of kind of change there in what we can be observing. Um, and then we want to just tell the software which data it is, what the target variable is, um, there's some other options available. And you can have the output in lots of different ways. I'm going to show the output in Excel, but also is provided nicely in kind of like a web page. So if you have the data set up correctly, it's very easy to kind of run the model. It's all done in the cloud and um, it's relatively fast with a sample size of 3000 in this case. So all the output is provided here on the web page. I'm going to walk through it in Excel. Um, so yeah, the actual kind of button clicking part of it is really simple. The difficult part is how to interpret the output and utilize it for making good decisions as a manager. Um, okay, so back to um, this kind of output. If you downloaded the output in Excel, this is what you would get. So right now, this is just describing the input data. Um, and what it does is it looks at the average for all the predictors overall for the entire sample, and then also split up. Um, uh, it's got the standard deviation, the median, the maximum. So you can just kind of understand a bit of your kind of total sample, the total characteristics of people in your data set. We know the outcome. Um, what percent of each is provided here. The next kind of thing to look at would be these model results. So this is the parameters or like a beta coefficient is or just a coefficient that relates the variance or change in the predictor variable to the likelihood that someone does or does not do the outcome of interest. Um, it's not worthwhile to compare these to each other. So comparing uh, whether or not someone had Gmail to their age, um, the size of these values is not relevant. It's not a apples to apples comparison. 
So like if I tried to get a sense of which variable is most important from these parameters, I would be misled. And the reason being is it's trying to relate the change in the predictor variable to the change in likelihood. But some predictor variables have lots of range and some only toggle back and forth between one or zero. So for instance, for Gmail, right, um, it can only be a one or a zero. Either a customer does have Gmail or they don't. Okay, so any impact it has on likelihood would be a one or a zero times the, you know, multiplied by the impact on the likelihood to book. Versus age can range from 18 to 76. So you, you might have like a 50 point um, or even 60 point, you know, range there in the change in the predictor. And so you need a much smaller coefficient to kind of translate that change in that x variable to the change in the likelihood. Um, so anyways, what you can take away from this is just the positive or negative uh, intercept. So anyways, if it's positive, like email, I know that having this email 25 compared to that reference category, which is just getting the informational email, um, means they're much more likely, or they're more likely to book a trip on Airbnb. So that $25 off promotion was more effective, it appears, according to this, in predicting the likelihood. So don't um, care necessarily about the uh, kind of size, the magnitude of these variables. Care much more about just the um, positive or negative uh, values here. And another thing you want to look at in this output table are these p-values. So it's like the probability that you would observe that exact same result. Um, or the probability that you'd observe a different value here if you repeated the process again. So if you sent kind of the same type of emails out to the same type of people using Alaska Airlines, what's the probability that the results would be different? Uh, that's kind of what you can interpret these p-values as. There's a statistical interpretation, but that's kind of the basic um, way to interpret it in a way that's intuitive and makes sense. So usually we consider something statistic or we have confidence in it. We think it's going to be reliable. It would kind of show up again if we kind of repeated the process of collecting this data. Um, we consider it significant if the probability of it being a different value is less than 5%. So anything less than 0.05 we would think would be something we'd want to pay attention to. So in this case, I want to have anything that's really small be highlighted green. So like I want to pay attention to all these variables with a p-value of less than 0.05. Okay, that just gives me more confidence that I would observe that same statistical relationship between the predictor and the outcome again. And given that I'm confident I'd observe it again, it makes me want to spend time thinking about it. If it's not significant, if it's like, okay, there's a negative relationship between number of tickets purchased on the itinerary and likelihood to book on Airbnb, but its p-value is 0.5, so I don't want to waste a lot of mental energy thinking about that because the next time I did it, the relationship might become positive or it could just be zero. So it's just not worth my consideration. So I identify ones that are significant and maybe I would even like sort this output by ones that are significant. So I could go ahead and do um, a custom sort based on maybe column E. I want the smallest values on top. And so these are all the variables that I really want to put mental energy into understanding as a manager. Okay. So if it's negative, I want to wonder why would it be negative? So having the address in Eugene means there's a kind of decreased likelihood that someone would book a trip on Airbnb. Bryson, do you have any uh, kind of initial thoughts or uh, hypotheses? Does that make sense to you? Is it, uh, if someone lives in Eugene, does it make sense to be less likely to book a trip when they come fly to Eugene? Definitely makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> if it's very significant, hopefully there's some obvious 
explanation to it. But as a manager, you kind of want to wonder what's behind these. Um, sometimes they can help you develop you know, new hypotheses about what could be done, um, and it could help refine your uh, efforts in, in the future. So like, let's say I find out that being from Eugene means people are less likely to book on Airbnb. Well, next time I go to my friend at Alaska Airlines and say, hey, I want to keep spending $3 to send emails to people that book a trip to Eugene, but can we sort out anyone who lives in Eugene? And, you know, it's obvious in retrospect, but when the first time you go through it, you don't even think about that. Okay. Um, in particular, I'm interested in the email 25, right? Because that was the nature of the promotion. Um, I sent out three different types of emails. And the fact that this one seems to be effective uh, relative to the video at delivering customers who are likely to book makes me more excited about using that email again in the future. And that's controlling for the characteristics of the people that got that email, right? Because I have all these other predictors in the model. And so it's not just looking, you know, at the raw numbers of people who got the email who actually um, responded, because just by randomness, it's possible that maybe a bunch of people who have an address in Eugene happen to get a certain email promotion. So we wouldn't want them, we wouldn't want to just look at the raw numbers, we'd want to adjust it for the characteristics of the passengers. People that got the email taxi campaign, the promotional email where they got um, a free taxi ride from the airport, there's a positive relationship in terms of the parameter. So being having a one value on that variable may uh, was seen as being more predictive of booking on Airbnb but the p-value is only 0.13, which means there's a 13% chance that if we did this again, we wouldn't see that positive relationship. So we don't feel as confident that that email, 20, uh, email with the taxi, free taxi promotion is more effective than the video. We're going to ultimately get to the point where we're going to try to see the return on investment because both this email with $25 off and the email with taxi is $25 more expensive for everyone who responds to that email because we're paying $25 in lost revenue here or $25 to the taxi company here. Um, so it might be, even though it's more effective, it might not be worth it because of the additional cost. So that we're going to ultimately get to that point. Um, okay, so that's basically what you want to do with this initial output is think about um, whether or not variables are likely to be uh, significant, so likely to be stable if you kind of repeated this process, and then spend some mental energy as a manager knowing the context, thinking about the implications of these different variables and how it could inform your tactics moving forward. Another thing that is important output here on this page is the confusion matrix and the hit rate, which basically shows us how well our model is with all these different predictors at predicting the various types of outcomes. So there's two types of outcomes we could see. We could see someone that does book on Airbnb or someone who doesn't. And our model looks at all the characteristics of a, a traveler and says, okay, based on their characteristics, do we predict they will or will not stay with us? And then it can compare that prediction to what actually happened. So if we look down here, we can see the model predictions for each individual. And what we care about is the probability or the estimated probability of people booking a trip on Airbnb. So this probability of being one. So in this case, just like with the first, you know, 20 people or whatever, we see that whoever this customer is, um, customer number 31, based on their characteristics, our model thinks there's a 63% chance that they will book on Airbnb. So it predicts, because it's above 50, it predicts that they will. So it gives them a score of 1. What actually happened is they did book on Airbnb. And so our model was correct in this case. Um, there are times where our model is incorrect. So, for instance, for this customer number 1, based on their characteristics, our model only thought there was a 19% probability that they would book on Airbnb. In actuality, they did. They did book a stay with us. And so our model was incorrect. And what this confusion matrix does is it just sums up all those predictions versus actuality. 
to let us observe where our model is highly effective and where it's not. So what we see here in this confusion matrix, this count, is that there's 3,000 observations. 2,572 of them were predicted um, to do a certain thing and actually did that. And what we see is there's this huge skew or huge bias towards predicting people will not book on Airbnb. That makes sense because we know from the raw data that 85% of people were not going to um, actually book a stay. And so our model is conservative and tends to say, hey, people, this person probably won't book with Airbnb unless all their characteristics line up a certain way such that they're you know, the most extreme in terms of the most likely to book on Airbnb. For instance, look at customer number two. Based on customer number two's characteristics for all these, like what type of email account they had, where they lived, our model thought there's a 49% chance that they would book on Airbnb. What's compared to everyone else is green, right? There's a, that means they're, that's kind of a higher value in terms of what we have observed, but that's less than 50%. So our model predicted that they wouldn't book on Airbnb. They did book a stay on Airbnb, and so our model was incorrect. We're only off by 1%, but that just is a good ex exhibit of the bias towards being conservative, given that uh, overall there's a big propensity to not book on Airbnb. So our model predicted an outcome of zero almost 96% of the time, I think. So if we say out of 3,000, 2,960 were predicted not to book on Airbnb. That's like 99% or something. Um, yeah. Uh, 99, almost 99% of people were, um, based on their characteristics, predicted not to book on Airbnb. So only 40 people, our model saw that they had all these characteristics lined up in a way that they were confident enough to say, I think that they'll book a stay. So if you were kind of conservative and you had, let's say, a new set of 3,000 people that were going to travel to Eugene the next month, and you said, let's only spend the $3 to email people who are predicted that they will stay, you would only send it to 40 people about. So that might be like almost too conservative. You might actually send it to people that the model thinks has a 40% likelihood of booking because it's a high enough probability that you feel like, oh, let's take the chance. It only costs us $3. Um, so anyways, uh, for here, we see that about 1.3% of all the people were just predicted to stay on Airbnb. Okay, what we really care about is these diagonals, um, which is where, where our model's ac accurate. So what was predicted to happen actually happened. So these people in this row is the sum of all the people who actually did uh, not book a trip on Airbnb. Okay, so that's about 85%, um, right? We saw that earlier, 85% of people didn't book on Airbnb, um, and 15% did. So we are, you know, pretty um, accurate overall, right? 2,500 people were correctly classified based on what they did. But what we are is basically extremely accurate when it comes to those people who um, we predict aren't going to do it. So of the people we predicted that wouldn't do it, these 2,960, we can see that um, most of them behaved as expected. 85% behaved as expected. Okay. Over here, we see that of the people that our model predicted would book on Airbnb, um, 28 actually did. So we were 70% correct. So if you just look at the predictions, overall we're, we're pretty correct. right? We got most of the people we predicted wouldn't book, didn't book, and most people we predicted did book a stay on Airbnb actually did. So we can see the relative strengths and weaknesses of the model um, there. Where our model isn't as good as we just focus on what actually happened, we're pretty bad at um, identifying people that did book. So of the 444 people that did book a trip on Airbnb, we only identified 28 um, of them. So and as a percentage, that's not 
not so awesome. This seems, seems like a pretty serious problem. It is. You can correct for it. You could just set a different prediction rule. So, uh, yeah. um, I could say, like, right now we have basically, unless someone's over, let's say, 50% predicted likelihood, then we're just going to classify them as unlikely. But we could change this rule right here. So, I could say equals if this is, let's say, greater than 0.4, 1, otherwise 0. Oh, man, why does it like that? It's text. i got to change it to general, maybe. Or maybe change it to number. Oh, hmm. let's just do it over here. I hope this isn't text, is it? Yeah, it's a percentage, cool. So let's do it over here. Equals if this value, the probability of them booking is greater than 40%, then we'll give it a 1. If not, we'll give it a 0. So basically, we just weakened the criteria. And so more people will be given a 1 than had before, such as person number 2. And then we can see if that's, um, so we'll call this adjusted prediction and uh, correct. <laughs> um, so equals uh, if this equals this comma one comma zero um, and then we would want to know especially for people that were predicted that were one if they were correct so we want to do like um, how do I want to do that? I guess I could just sort. <laughs> There's probably a more elegant way to do this, but um, if I just sorted it by people that I predicted to be 1, so that would be column H, largest to smallest. So let's see, how many people do I predict to be 1? Quite a few. Um, a lot more. Let's see, 160 now. So, yeah, definitely increase the number of people I predicted to be one. And the rate that that's correct is uh, 86 out of 160. Mm. So, so roughly half. Yeah, a little over 50%. Yeah. So I, just by doing that adjustment, instead of only correctly identifying 6% of people, I've now increased it to 54% of people. Mm. Oh, wait. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm doing it here. Okay, so um, now my prediction is less accurate here, but I'll ident identify more of them here. So what I want to do now is, the way I sorted it was not so helpful there. Um, I sorted by prediction. So my um, of the people that I predicted that actually did it, it went from 70 down to 54%. That's what I just showed you right there. But what I'll do is I'll show you that I can identify more people that actually did predict. So let's sort not by column H, but by column F. We want to sort by the act what actually happened. And of those people who actually did book, um, what percent did we predict? That's what we want to know. So, and I think there's like 440 people. It's see, this is like the manual version of that thing right there. So yeah, of the 444, we got 86. So equals. 86 divided by 444, almost 20%. So basically what we did is we, we weakened our criteria so that we're going to make predictions that are going to be more biased towards action. Let's say if we're going to use this as a rule of whether or not we send out an email to someone, because we would know all these characteristics before the email was necessarily sent out, right? Because we got all this data just based on them booking the flight to Eugene. So once we had all that data, we could run it through our model. We could come up with a probability that they were going to do something. We could set a decision rule, which is anyone over 40% percent 
we'll go ahead and send an email to. And in this case, um, of those people that got an email, only 54% would book versus before we would only send it to 40 people, but 70% would book. So that got worse, but on the other hand, the good news is um, instead of only getting 6% of people, you know, that um, actually would have booked in response to our email, we now could get 19% of those people. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Interesting. Yeah. So the way we're going to use this data is not really using this as informing our actions, but oftentimes people do build models that are like, like AI machine learning is basically doing a ton of logistic regressions where they care about something like, you know, TikTok is basically a version of um, Vine. Remember Vine back in the day, like those 15 second little kind of funny videos yeah. with AI. So the only reason why like TikTok is way more successful or one of the main reasons than Vine is because they have an AI algorithm that basically looks at the content of the video itself and predicts whether or not people will watch it again um, or not, right? Or share it or not. So they look at some like decision outcome they care about, like that makes it more or less viral and then surfaces it into people's feeds. So that's using the kind of logistic regression with actual content of the video as the predictor to inform the feed that people would see. Same thing with like Facebook, right? They have a news algorithm that's based on AI where they would think like whether or not that piece of content will be engaging to you. So I think for a long time their criteria was, would you stay on Facebook or would you leave the website was like mm -hmm. the outcome they cared about. Um, so it's like just machine learning is oftentimes just fancy logistic regressions and then using it as a decision tool whether to show someone a piece of content or not. And so you don't need necessarily uh, expected probability over 50%. You can change your criteria to be just anything above a certain percentage. Like, yeah. Um, in, in this case, we're just going to, we're gonna use it um, for different purposes, but I just like to know where my model's strong, where my model's weak. So if I wanted to um, make sure I didn't waste any effort on someone who is unlikely to stay, this model would be awesome because I'm really doing a good job of picking up people who aren't going to book. But if I wanted to make sure I identify people that were going to respond to it, it's not so great currently because I'm, you know, only basically capturing 28 of the 444 total people who would book on Airbnb, just 15%. If I change the criteria, I can improve the percentage. Oh wait, not 15%, 6%, 6% of the 15%. I can get it up to 19% um, just by changing it to 40. Okay. But yeah, so the, the kind of point of spending time thinking about this is just knowing where your model's strong and where your model's um, weak. Um, the other kind of point of this output that is useful to spend time thinking about is the elasticities. And that lets you compare across different variables. So across different predictors, which ones are the most likely to predict um, someone will book or not on Airbnb. So we always wanna pay attention to the one category because that's what we care about, people booking. We don't really care about the zero, which is people not booking. And these are elasticities. So if you think about like, um, oftentimes in economics, we talk about uh, price elasticity so would a drop in the price of gasoline cause people to um, go on more trips, to drive more often? Then that would be elastic, so a negative elasticity. Well, so the higher the price, the less people consume gasoline. There's other things that are actually the opposite. The higher the price, the more they consume it. So um, any status good, where you buy the good in order to show that you have purchasing power, you actually have a higher likelihood of buying it if it's more expensive because it is signaling. So like um, at a certain point, uh, like if you go to the club and you want to buy champagne or whatever, right? it's a public consumption, it's a status good. So in that case, the more it costs, the more people will want to buy it because they're basically buying it not for the champagne but to show off. But if they're going to have it privately with no one else around, the more it costs, the less likely they are to buy it. 
So the public-private nature of the consumption can s flip the elasticity between price and likelihood to buy when it comes to certain goods. In this case, we can see um, the elasticity between a 1% change in our predictor and the outcome. So the uh, on an absolute value basis, it's kind of easier to see in that case. So um, I don't necessarily want to care if it's negative or positive. I just want to see how influential it is to people's likelihood to book. So the most important um, variable in terms of predicting people's likelihood to book is how old they are. Okay, so a one percent increase in age would translate to a one point two eight percent decrease in likelihood to book. So that's considered elastic because it's it's more responsive to a change in the predictor. Um, so that's the uh, most important variable to look at. Interestingly, because age actually ranges from 18 to like 80, let's say, in our data set, if you just focused on the parameter, you would think age wasn't so important. It's very significant, but look how small it is. It's only 0.05. That's because it's, it's multiplying the coefficient times something that has a big range. So to kind of get it into the likelihood, it, it's got to like have a small coefficient versus you'd have a big coefficient for something that only toggles back between one and zero, like having an address in Eugene. So the elasticities helps us kind of see what's most important in terms of um, a change in, in the composition. So if I could basically have 3,000 people that were 1% younger, right? Let's say I go to Alaska Airlines and I say, can you just send me, you know, the people that are, you know, don't send me anyone over the age of 70 or whatever. So maybe that decreases the average age by 1%. That would increase the likelihood of people booking by 1.28%. It's kind of mm -hmm. hard to think of, like if you think of like Gmail, right? If you read like what elasticity is about, it says like a 1% increase in the predictor. Well, that makes total sense for things like price and age because you can imagine like you know, age going up by 1%. Guess what? You just got older over the past month. Your age went up by 1%. Um, the price can go up by 1%. You can just change the price. But how do you increase Gmail by 1%? All right, you can't. But let's say, let's say 50% of people in my sample um, have Gmail. I could imagine a different sample where the percentage of them that have a Gmail account is has increased by 1%. So maybe it goes from 50% to what's 1% of 50%, 0.5%. So it goes from the average sample doesn't have 50%, it's 50.5% is my average sample of people with Gmail. So that's how to interpret um, this. So in this case, what I would probably do, similarly to before, is I want to do some type of rank where I sort just by um, column E. And I want to focus on largest to smallest. And so these variables at the top, assuming they're statistically significant, because I want to make sure it's reliable, which is a separate consideration between magnitude, right? So I might go back to this one and make sure, you know, these are the ones that are have a p-value that's worth paying attention to. So um, email, taxi, tickets in Yahoo are not here. Perfect. Same, same there. So all these variables up here are significant. Um, maybe it's mm -hmm. in a slightly different order. And then the ones that I care about the most are age, then being a frequent flyer, if it's a round trip or not, where their address is, um, what type of promotion they got. Did they get this email with $25 off promotion? Do they have Gmail? Is their address in Oregon? Do they have .edu? Those are kind of the ones, and that's the order I'd want to pay attention to based on the correspondence to a change in the predictor and the change in the likelihood to book on Airbnb. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Um, however, it doesn't seem like, so the elasticity seems to indicate the age uh, might be something that we want to look at more closely. Where can we determine uh, what age brackets are most likely to purchase. Yeah, so 
as we currently set it up as a predictor, age we think of as a continuum. So like, mm. there's not we don't think of it as like millennials versus Gen X versus like, you know, that would be more thinking like age brackets where you might think like there's something culturally different with different age groups where it's like anyone who was in their transformative years when the internet was up and coming or anyone right. who was kind of experienced 9-11 or, you know, was around for the Great Depression. So sometimes age is more like about what people experienced in their formative years. And sometimes it's more like a cognitive decline. Like as you get older, you might become more rigid in your ways. So you might become less, you know, uh, adapt or have worse memory or whatever. So that's a great question because for the variable of age, you might want to come up with some hypotheses around what's behind this relationship. Is it cultural? Is it um, more just around uh, cognitive abilities? You know, is it that people don't want to stay in someone else's home if they're older? That might be more of like a cultural type thing. Or is it that they just don't know how to use websites to book things? And, and then there might be like a different cutoff. So what you could do is instead of treating age as a continuous variable as we did, you could split it up into different brackets and have dummy codes. So you could have like maybe um, 18 to 28 be like a reference category. And then you could compare every every other kind of like decade to that one category, just like we did with email, where we compare okay. having a Gmail versus having a, a Yahoo account or a .edu to all the other categories. And then you can see the impact relative to those other categories. So we might find out in that process that um, it's really people who are 50 to 60 who just hate Airbnb and, mm. you know, maybe people who've retired who are in their 60s, they're cool with Airbnb because they're just not as uptight anymore or they're into saving money. Maybe it's a proxy for saving money. So, yeah, that's a great question. Um, we don't want to just overreact to the prediction. We want to be thoughtful, informed of the context, come up with hypotheses for the relationship and then maybe investigate them further. It's worth thinking a lot about age, but we probably don't want to spend a lot of time thinking about like .edu because the elasticity is smaller and um, the p-value is smaller. So that's why it's important to kind of rank things by their p-value, so the probability that it is going to be reliable. Um, having a small p-value means it's more likely to be reliable, so we're more confident. and being big or being impactful of the outcome we care about is also worth our attention. That's why you can't be just like a pure like data scientist where you just like f focus on the numbers and type in the code. You have to have that kind of customer insight aspect as well. You merge them both together and then you can use this data to inform your decisions really nicely. So it's kind of the blend of deep knowledge about the domain and the ability to do the statistics. I think a lot of my students are oriented towards knowledge about the domain, but kind of afraid of the statistics. And part of the reason why I'm having them do these exercises is it's not that scary to do the statistics. If they do it one or two times, they'd get the hang of it, at least to a decent level. Um, and it would aid them for the rest of their aspects. So uh, as part of the case, there's a whole other aspect, which is looking at hosts. Um, so this is a two-sided market where you have travelers and you have hosts and Airbnb is the matchmaker. And it's no good in recruiting a bunch of people to stay on Airbnb if there aren't a lot of homes for them to stay in. So the host part of the data is looking at 400 hosts and trying to predict which ones were most likely to stick around. So some people might try out Airbnb, put their house up for rent, but have a bad experience or two and decide to no longer do it. And thankfully, um, before the city of Eugene shut down Airbnb, um, at least in this imagined scenario, we already had 400 people who signed up as hosts. And we know how many of them kind of stuck around until things were shut down or quit. And so we can do a predictive model that looks at likelihood to stay on the platform or retention being retained. So we can do a retention rate model as well. Um, I'll let kind of students go through that on their own. I won't preview it exactly. Um, but both of those um, can help inform what I want to now show, which is the customer lifetime value modeling, or for the host, it would be the host lifetime value. So this is a 
calculator I built in Excel that I like because it can help us see how changes in travelers' profiles impacts their likelihood to be booked according to our model, which then can be used to build out uh, an assessment of the customer lifetime value and the return on marketing, which would be, so I spent $3 to send someone an email, plus $3 to, spend, to send emails to other people who didn't book. And then the person that did book, I also spent $25 on giving them an incentive if they got those first kind of two promotional email types. So is all that expense to get a new customer worth it? I don't know unless I have some sense of how long they're going to be a customer, how much they're going to spend, what's my cost to serve them. So that's where I want to do some customer lifetime value calculations. So let me kind of explain what's going on here a bit. I have one calculator for travelers and another one for hosts. Okay. I have um, a bunch of different information about the travelers. These are the variables. So I know what type of promotional email they got, be it the $25 off or the taxi, the free taxi. If they didn't get either of those, then they got just the informational video email. I know what type of email account they had, Gmail, Yahoo, .edu, or something else. Their frequent flyer, where their address is, Oregon, Eugene, or somewhere else, their age, number of tickets, and round trip. Okay. Um, so down here, what I have is the average values for every traveler that is in my sample. So those are numbers that I just picked up from um, this original data set. Right. Remember, these are the average values for everybody in my sample. So I just copied and pasted those over. And then what I next needed is I take the coefficient estimates for my model, which basically transcribes or, or translates an observed value for one of these predictors to the probability that they would do the behavior I care about. So these are the coefficient estimates that we saw before, like 0.05 was the relationship between a change in age and change in likelihood to book. Um, address in Eugene was minus 1.567. So again, those were just copied and pasted over from the results, these model results. So address Eugene, negative 1.567. Um, age was minus 0 0.05, right? So these are copied and pasted over. And there's a particular formula you use to translate the observed values of some person in your sample times the coefficients into a score that can be converted into a probability or a percentage likelihood. So really these, you know, should be mm. percentages in this column. Um, so in this case, for the top one, this probability is the percentage likelihood that someone is going to book a stay on Airbnb. And down here for hosts, this is the probability that someone would be retained. They would remain a host putting their property up for rent on Airbnb. So um, basically, this is a little calculator where I can change the inputs, the observed values. It'll multiply by the coefficient, come up with this attractiveness score. You can see the formula here. Um, it's basically just this observed value times the corresponding coefficient plus this observed value times the corresponding coefficient. Those are kind of all added up together. They get translated into a percentage according to this um, uh, formula, which is just the exponent of this observed value divided by one plus the same thing. And then if this value, my decision rule is above 50%, I will score my predicted thing as a one or a zero. Um, and then I can basically, by knowing how many people are likely to be acquired, I can estimate the cost to acquire them, which can help me estimate their customer lifetime value, which can help me understand the return on marketing of sending the emails. So when I build this whole thing out, it's a very powerful tool where I can see how changes in my customer base or my potential customer base, my prospects, translates into the return on money spent with the tactic that I'm 
going to utilize. So for this fir first one, right, I'm going to estimate the cost to acquire a traveler or a customer to be, um, it's going to be, uh, let's say I send it to a thousand people. I send the email to a thousand people, right? So I have a thousand people and I spent $3 for each of them, right? Because I uh, basically had to send the email out to a big group of people just to acquire a few people. You know, you follow me, Bryson? I'm following. Okay. I'm still. Yeah. So the problem is, let's say I only get 11% of them. I still spent money on all 100% of them. So I have to allocate the cost to the other 89% of people who didn't book a trip to the people that were acquired. Okay. So Correct. this total yeah. cost of sending out the email and it, um, I could just do it on a, um, an individual customer basis, but I think this follows more to the actual reality of what happened is divided by that total number of people that got the email times the people I acquire, which is that percentage mm -hmm. likelihood to be acquired. Right. So that's how much I spent on the email campaign for each customer. Does that make sense? So I sent the email to a thousand people, but only 11% of them were required. So I divide, well, actually this one's even easier. This is about 10% of people were acquired. So that's a hundred people. So I spent $3,000 and I got a hundred people. So per person I got, it cost me $30, right? Let's say, you know, $3,000 was my cost. A hundred people was what I got. So this is cost. This is people or new customers. So cost per person would be this divided by that. I'm estimating this cost per acquired person by using the probability of someone being acquired. So I'm estimating the number of people that would get acquired given I sent out an email to a thousand people. Mm. Make sense? Right? Makes sense. So let me zoom in a little bit here because it's yeah, and maybe it's too hard to see. Um, oh, oh, yeah, it's a little small, but I can kind of squint my eyes and see it. Um. So there's so there's more to this though. Okay. But ask your question. Well, it's just yeah, I was kind of you know how do we interpret this you know, as a manager? Do I look at this and say okay, I'm going to email the twenty five dollars off coupon yes. because there's a, a a lower cost of acquisition? Yes. Um, okay. So this is for everybody in which thirty three percent of people got the twenty five dollars off, thirty three percent got the taxi. But I could change things up. So I could say if I put a one here instead of 33, 33, that means if someone got the $25 off and they didn't get the mm -hmm. taxi, they have a higher likelihood of being acquired. So if I emailed a thousand people, I would actually acquire 140 of them. So the cost of $3,000 of $3, would be divided by 140 instead of up here it would be divided by 110 people that got acquired. So it's the total yes. cost divided by the number of people I got versus down here for the $25 taxi ride, I only got 10% of people. And down here for the informational video, I only got 8% um, of people. So 80 people have to bear the brunt of all $3,000 that were spent just to get those 80 people. So the most expensive customer is the one acquired with the um, kind of just the informational email with the video. Mm. Now I, they got a zero for both these. So it's, you know, zero times that coefficient, zero times that coefficient. So they have a lower value here. So that means they have a lower probability, which means I got fewer of them. So the total cost of the campaign was higher per customer. So Quick question though, are we counting the cost of the $25 in addition to the... We should be, but we haven't yet. <laughs> okay. So this whole thing's gonna flip now. 
Uh oh. Because for this guy, it also cost me twenty five dollars per customer. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. And same with um the next guy. So this twenty five dollars is contingent on getting this email that's expensive. So I can multiply that $25 times the observed value here plus the observed value here. So if either one of those is a one, then I'll multiply $25 by one and I add a $25 cost of the promotion. Mm -hmm. It's contingent though on someone actually being acquired, right? We don't pay that money up front. So this $3,000 right here is paid up front and we get a certain number of people, so they bear the brunt of the total cost of the campaign. And then if either one of these is a one, we also pay $25 for them. Um, so now all of a sudden, and I should change this up here. Now this includes the cost of the incentive for us. And guess what happened? This average email that only got 8% of people, now all of a sudden looks pretty good because there's no additional cost to it. All these other ones went up by the cost of people getting the promotion where this one stayed pretty low. So now this one looks like the best one, right? So now, now my next question is, and I think we're getting towards it is, well, what's the lifetime value? Because maybe it's a higher cost of acquisition, but um, yeah, I make, their the lifetime value makes it make yeah there's two sense. there's two factors so one's the lifetime value and then two is well maybe i have um you know there's better economics per customer but i get more customers up here so on a per sure. customer basis this one's looking like the winner but look how many more customers i got i got an, if i sent this to a thousand people i got six percent more that's 60 extra customers so hmm. it cost me more to get those 60 extra customers it cost the cost of the promotion, $25. But I knew it was going to cost more when I designed it. <laughs> it was intentionally costly because I thought it would be more effective. So yeah, you need to think about the customer lifetime value, which is the per customer economics, and then the total portfolio of customers, which is the portfolio economics. So we're going we're gonna to build that all in. What I'm excited about right here now, what we're getting to, is we're seeing how a change in the characteristics has an impact on the per customer economics. Now there's other things we can we can mess with. Like we could put Bryson and Connor in here. <laughs> I, we can we don't have to do average values for everyone. We could, you know, pay Alaska to send it to specific people. Maybe we'll That's change true. this to like Bryson's uh right uh Bryson's dad, Bryson, right? So let's say you both get um, the email at $25 off. So I just put a one in for each of you. Mm -hmm. um, you have Gmail, he has Yahoo, okay? Um, you maybe both have .edu, but you're not using it when you buy your Alaska Airlines flights. All right, he's an MVP, frequent flyer. Um, you're just a regular flyer. Okay, we're gonna put you both as living outside of Eugene right now. This is before you became a PhD student, um, because otherwise it's gonna get really ugly. He's 65, you're 28. Maybe that's not exactly correct, but whatever. Um, you both buy two tickets. Let's say, you know, uh, you're gonna travel with someone and it's round trip. All right just basically being almost the exact same except for him being an MVP, you being regular, you having Gmail, him having Yahoo, and you being young and him being old, we go from a 9% probability to a 43% probability, <laughs> which means the cost to acquire people like your dad would be about $60 versus the cost to acquire you would be about $31. So I could take this whole formula, like basically I could take this cost to acquire formula and I could go back to this original um, traveler's output here. Remember this choice sensitivity? I have a probability. Oh no, where was it? Yeah, I have a probability for everybody. 
So if I shoot, um, I wanna, if I copy this, I could go ahead and for every single person, this is looking backwards, but let's say I had new information on people that were going to travel and I used my model to do a probability. I could go ahead, I think all I need is, um, oh, I don't know what email they got, but uh, instead of R12, I could change it to D41. And let's assume um, everybody does get the $25 off because that was most effective. This would be my cost to acquire for any given customer. So I'm just looking at their probability and using that to assess a cost to acquire. Now, I sorted it by people that were likely to come here, so the results aren't that interesting, but like you can see some of these people, like 186, they only have a 2% likelihood of being acquired, so they're considered very expensive. Um, mm. So, you know, one way of deciding who you want to send promotional emails to is based on the probability. Another one is based on the economics. And so that's what right. we're doing is we're translating these probabilities to economics where we can decide, you know, there's a break even point where the cost to acquire is uh, less than the value of the customer, which is what we're building out in this, this model, you know, so you could basically take this whole entire model, which I'm using just for profiles, right? These are just kind of profiles of potential customers, but I could do it for very specific people and I could inform, I could have a model based on my computer, whether or not I do something based on the economics, not just on the probability. So the probability of the behavior, which can be estimated based on characteristics, can bleed into my economics model, which then can help me determine whether or not to do an activity. It's, you know, very efficient. Uh, it's like, you know, whether Uber wants to send you a promotion or not, or whether Amazon wants to send you a promotion or not. A lot of that stuff, they have, you know, millions and millions of customers, but they can do all this customized activity based on their expected likelihood of you doing a behavior. And now with AI, they don't even have to set what variables they want. They can kind of just let the AI look at everything about you and just kind of without even, you know, being very thoughtful around what the predictors are. So yeah, the next step in this is to have a sense of their customer lifetime value, which is going to need the input of other variables that um, we're going to assume is stable for everybody, but it doesn't have to be stable for everyone. For instance, um, in this host lifetime value, there's good reason to adjust it per neighborhood because we know from the uh, starting data that if you look at the average observed value for each neighborhood, it's very different than um, for the whole city of Eugene as a whole. So I have it by location. So anyways, for the, in this case, there could be reason to believe that a customer of you know a certain age might have different revenue. Maybe they spend more. So it's possible that they're less likely to be acquired, but more likely to spend a lot of money. Um, in this case, we're just gonna assume all these values are fixed across all the customers to do our customer lifetime value calculation. So customer lifetime value, a simple way of doing it is taking um, the margin, which is your revenue minus your cost to serve, and multiplying that by your retention rate, which in this case is 70%. Um, and then you divide that whole thing by one plus the discount rate, which is just counting for, you know, revenue you're gonna get way out in the future isn't as exciting as revenue you're gonna get today, right? Time value of money. Um, also the uncertainty that comes with it, right? Money that's supposed to be get, gotten way out in the future is, you know, you're less confident that it'll actually show up. And also um, the retention rates factored in here as well. And then we subtract um, the cost to acquire, because the lifetime value would be greater for someone 
that we didn't spend a bunch of money to get. We can basically, you know, take someone with who would have a healthy lifetime value and make them negative if we spend, you know, $10 million trying to acquire them. Right. Um, some people, you know, make fun of like Uber and that they'll spend $60 trying to get a new customer, but then that customer only uses some of it and they never make back the money. So they're like, Hey, we have tons of customer growth. Well, that's cause you're spending more than you're going to get from them. Um, in this case, we want to lock in all these values because we're just going to drag it down. Um, the only thing we don't lock in is the cost to acquire. And so if I did the formula correctly, that's my customer lifetime value for each of them. My return on marketing would be the outcome I care about divided by the input. So for every dollar spent um, trying to acquire a customer here, the best person to acquire is you, Bryson. All right. It cost me $1, but I get $5.29 back. Um, the nice thing is all of these are above one, so I'm getting more money back than it costs me to do it. So I, in this case, should be quite aggressive. Um, Send it to everybody. Yeah. Um, it just has good economics of Airbnb. Unfortunately, with coronavirus, they were going to IPO and things are looking great for them and all their employees, but uh, obviously travel has been halted, so these numbers aren't looking as good. That's why you need that discount rate, right? There's there's an unexpected global virus that's going to happen in the future. We change the discount rate to account for the that risk, and all of a sudden, uh -oh. yeah. now most people don't have a positive return on, on marketing spend. So... It's really yeah. sensitive to um, the discount rate, the retention rate, revenue, cost of serve. Assuming these are correct estimates of the profiles, we have these these values. But the last thing to think about is customer portfolio value. So if we got a whole, you know, portfolio of customers of certain characteristics that had certain lifetime values, we could add them all up and have a kind of customer portfolio value, which just accounts for the number of customers. So in this case, we would be equal to the number of customers. So let's say for each of these, we send out, send the email to a thousand people times how many we get. So in this case, we get 110, 140, 180, 90, and 430. Uh, unfortunately, it's probably not a thousand of you out there, so we might not be able to find that many. But the number of customers that get acquired would be multiplied by the um, customer lifetime value, so the per customer value, and that would be the portfolio value. So in this case, like especially looking at um, these three, which are our different email campaigns, Okay, so while the highest customer lifetime value was the informational email video, right, where we didn't have to pay 20, a $25 incentive, in terms of portfolio value, the best one to send out would be the one with the $25 off to stay because we got 60 more customers and all 60 of those customers had CLVs that were close enough to right. the highest one. So this is like Walmart versus Nordstrom. Nordstrom has a few customers that are worth a lot when it comes to apparel. You know, Walmart also sells apparel, but they have customers who aren't worth as much in terms of how much profit they get off of the sales of apparel, but they just have way more customers. So overall, you know, Walmart's a much more valuable company, even if you just focused only on their apparel sales compared to Nordstrom. Make sense? Makes sense. So um, this pretty powerful managerial decision tool, it's based on looking at characteristics of customers, seeing how those predict a behavior you care about, and then using that predicted likelihood to build out a customer lifetime value model. Um, we do a similar thing down here, but instead we have information about hosts. Um, we have the characteristics of the host. We're using average values for everybody. The profiles here are based on neighborhoods. So I might focus on a certain neighborhood of Eugene to really go out and aggressively try to recruit hosts um, based on my expectations of how likely they are to stick around. 
the baseline numbers I'm putting in is using the overall sample for Eugene for all these characteristics and then just varying which neighborhood um, they belong to. But I could adapt these numbers to the average value for each neighborhood because for the um, baseline data, right, I know that um, for each neighborhood, I could calculate an average score, for instance, for revenue. And maybe one neighborhood, a typical home in that neighborhood brings in more revenue than the typical home in a different neighborhood. So these um, values here could be improved upon, or I could be more precise with my inputs. And in particular, the revenue that is generated by a home in that neighborhood is important to customize, potentially. That's why I have these little notes right here, because that's a factor in the what I'm calling the HLV, the host lifetime value. So in this case, my um, kind of host lifetime value formula, again, is the margin, which is the revenue minus the cost to serve. In this case, I might choose this revenue value because I might customize it for each host. I'll have cost to serve be consistent because I don't know any better. Um, and I'll lock this one in, but I'll let that vary. Um, and then I multiply that by my retention rate, which is going to be estimated right here. That's the whole point of our model. Um, and then I divide all that by one plus my discount rate minus my retention rate, which I estimate. Um, and then I subtract out the acquisition cost, which in this case is given. So the differences between um, mm. the top one here and the bottom one here is just I'm estimating a different part of the model. So the lifetime value model has different inputs, and I can estimate um, different values of the inputs given the characteristics I observe. Um, so I can, you know, I could actually build a, a regression that would predict the revenue per user. So I could have, I could predict two parts mm -hmm. of the model if I wanted to. I could do two separate regressions. I could do one regression that predicts likelihood to be retained, and another one that predicts um, revenue. But actually, one thing that's pretty cool about um, Ingenious, this program right here, is they have in their predictive modeling packages, which is really useful for marketing context, a discrete continuous model, which is basically where there's two parts of the decision. There's one to buy or not to buy, and then the another part is how much. Or will mm -hmm. they be retained or not retained? And then how much revenue will they generate if they're retained? So sometimes like there's a second continuous aspect, that's the continuous part, that's depend dependent on the discrete part, which is the toggle one zero. So in this case, they talk about like um, customers who usually purchase for small quantities might experience a higher chance of making a future purchase. So they make lots of small frequent purchases, so your expected likelihood of them making a purchase next week is high, but the expected value of the purchase is low. Think of like a convenience store shopper um, or someone that goes to like the small local grocer versus going to Costco. Right? The Costco shopper shops less frequently but buys a much bigger amount when they go to Costco. So I'm not having this be part of the lesson today, but it's kind of neat that this program, cool. if you set up the data correctly, the analysis kind of takes care of itself and it's all about interpreting the output. Um, so yeah, this is a, a kind of a whole case. Um, there's certain questions, but it just kind of shows you how you can be hired into a job like as, you know, in charge of the Eugene market for Airbnb and you can go about being creative, thinking about how to leverage your friends and who have positions at other companies um, to do some type of email campaign. So it's a marketing tactic, but you can be smart about it. You can split it up into like three different options because you don't know ahead of time which one's most effective or most cost effective. And you can look at other characteristics of your customers to predict the outcome. 
and that can bleed through to the customer lifetime value, which can bleed through to the customer portfolio value, and that's how you can kind of not just make decisions based on your gut, but use your gut and also test it and get feedback and see what works. Um, so that's kind of the whole case as a, as a whole. Um, in the write-up to the case, I ask students to make several recommendations, um, many of which are not really about um, just interpreting the data like I did, but also adding in other insights from, you know, being now, you know, advanced students in studying marketing and there's, you know, a lot of other strategic considerations and um, other recommendations they could make that are beyond what's in the data. But the kind of manager of the future is able to marry data with deep domain knowledge and creativity and use that to um, make decisions. Pretty cool. I love it. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, smaller companies now are trying to do all this manually and the bigger companies like, you know, on Amazon are setting it all up to be done automatically and um, using, exploiting AI. But AI is, a lot of it is just based on this logistic regression model where you care about someone does or doesn't do something. They stay on the website or they don't. They, so they, they just add in tons and tons of parameters and yeah, just see... Just blast it with parameters. <laughs> well, a lot of like, you know, machine uh, learning for vision, right? It's just, they're just turning, you know, actual visual information into discrete information on many vectors. And then, yep. um, you know, repeatedly looking at how that predicts some outcome of interest. Um, or even like image classification is like, you know, is it or is it not a dog? <laughs> is it or is it not a pet? Like, it's like, there's all these different um, discrete classifications of what's in an image that's, you know, these image recognition things are built on it. Yep. So it's something very simple that is then they do these simultaneous estimations using these graphical processing units. Um, I don't know, you know, the exact computer science, but the logic is pretty simple. You observe something that might predict an outcome or a classification you care about, and computers now are good at, you know, looking at the statistical relationship between inputs and, and some output. And then can you use it to inform decision making in a cool way? All right, so I'm gonna pause this. Hopefully that's enough coverage that will empower my students to answer the case. Um, <laughs> All the questions in the case. Yeah. Well, this plus all the other information they already have, and uh, you know they're pretty advanced students by now. So I'm impressed. I mean, I did my when did I do my MBA? 2015, 2013, uh, 2013 to 2015, um, and the stuff that we're doing here kind of blows it out of the water, to be honest. Yeah, I, I do feel a little bit bad for my students because I'm <laughs> asking them to do more than what might be typical in an undergrad experience. But uh, And a lot of them aren't necessarily going to use this because they're just going to wind up in some, you know, sales or service type position. Um, right. But there are a few students who end up using it or end up going on to pursue, like, um, a career in analytics, like marketing analytics, something like that. So, yeah, it... I think it's cool. I, like, I, I wish I had 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 something like this. If you like spreadsheets, like I like spreadsheets. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's like, yay. Um, yeah, I think at least five students out of 100 every year are glad they do these exercises, <laughs> <laughs> which is enough for me to keep doing them. Um, but yeah, this is content that sometimes is in an undergrad class, sometimes it's in an MBA class, sometimes it's in a master's of analytics. Um, you know, you right. as a PhD student, you're more involved in understanding the statistics behind a choice model, but, um, and being thoughtful around all the assumptions and confounds and looking at things like interactions, which we're not covering here. But this could handle interactions. You just have to set it up manually beforehand. It's not as flexible as like R or SAS or Stata or something like that. All right. 
students. Sweet. Yeah. Peace. <laughs>